Well, and welcome to this second and the second in a row because we had the first one yesterday. Uh, lecture series of the Kandelabland Center. During this, I was going to say the Lent term, but it has changed. So we're now in the autumn term of the LNC. And uh, I suppose that some of you attended Danny Dorning's uh, lecture and book presentation today. And today, privilege of having with us, Michael Reed, who's also going to do a book presentation there. He'll be signing copies of the book at the end. So, we'll explain the trials and triumphs of a modern country. And topic and center could not be more timely. Spain is right now at a crossroads and elections that have delivered, not for the first time, but for the first time in this sort of circumstances in which a single vote, although previous parliament, the vote of the one existing, actually determined that uh, Pedro Santos became the prime minister. So now every single vote counts, and it counts much more than ever. So what's going to happen? Why in Spain the situation it is? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it something that I'm going to be talking about? And uh, Michael is well known to many of us, many of you, but I'm just going to highlight a bit of his uh, biography. He's an author, journalist, and speaker. He specializes on Latin American, Iberian, and international affairs. And in 2023, he became one of our colleagues here uh, because he was appointed as a visiting professor in practice at the School of Public Policy of the London School. So if you don't have enough of him today, you can see much more because he's going to be around. He's going to many years to come. From 1994 until 2023, he was a staff journalist at The Economist. From 2014 to 2022, he set up, if I'm not mistaken, and wrote uh, Bello. Uh, Bello, I don't know. I mean, Bello. Bello. That's good. That's pronounced in, in the Spanish way. Column of Latin American and was senior and and was a senior editor. In addition, from 2016 to 2021, he was the Economist Spain correspondent, <laughs> responsible for many of the things you've read about Spain and shaping many of our, your views and our views about Spain. From 1999 until 2013, he was the magazine's America's editor. He was previously the correspondent in Brazil from 1996 until 1999, and I guess he was responsible for me becoming a permanent uh, subscriber to the Congress because I <laughs> actually decided to become, after reading the country report on Brazil in the late 1990s, while traveling on my first trip uh, to Brazil. So yeah, this gave me the full background to be there. Consumer Industries Correspondent between 94 and 95, and Correspondent in Mexico and Central America, between 1990 and 93. He spent most of the 1980s based in Lima, covering the Andean region for The Guardian and the BBC. Um, had the new book, Spain, published by Yale University Press in March, and is going to come out by Spasa in February next year in Spanish. And he has got other books, like Forgotten Cont Continent, A History of the New Latin America, which had a second edition in 2017, and Brazil, the travel rise of global power uh, uh, in 2014, and both books again published by Yale University Press, which is not a bad in house type of uh, uh, publisher. He has been awarded the Maria Moores Cover Prize in 2003 for outstanding reporting on Latin America by Columbia University, Graduate School of Journalism, and he has received the Brazil's Orden Nacional de Cruzeiro do Sul in 2000 for his writing on Brazil and the Mercosur region, and that's extremely well deserved, I would say. He has contributed uh, articles to a wide range of publications, including, among others, and Paese, the New York Times, The Observer, and The Times Literary uh, Supplement. As a background, he studied politics, philosophy, and economics at Balliol College in Oxford. So for those of you that attended Danny Dorning's uh, uh, lecture yesterday, studying PPE, not always Rex countries. <laughs> yeah. And he speaks both Spanish and Portuguese. 
uh, fluently and has uh, Spanish speaking <laughs> wife uh, sitting over here from Peru. He's a frequent speaker to business, academic, policy, public, uh, public policy audiences, and has testified before the Foreign Relations Committee of the US Senate and the Foreign Affairs Committee of the UK, UK House of Commons. So without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andres. I'm going to just uh, stand up here if that's okay. Um, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. You didn't have to bore people with, with, the, with all, all the last 40 years, but it was kind of you to do so. Um, and thank you to all of you who are here for coming. Um, uh, let me say, um, since um, I'm delighted to be a visiting professor of pra in practice, but as you may know, that means you're not actually paid, which means it would be great if some of you can buy the book, um, which has which has a 30% discount. So you know, this is your turn. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the last, um, well, the current period in Spain, right? But let me start by saying that I think Spain is a country that is more visited than understood especially in the UK. And um, uh, and I think, I mean, it's quite extraordinary, like 12 million Britons went to Spain between January and, and August. And then in the year before the pandemic, um, the full year in 2019, I think it was 18 million from memory. I mean, these are colossal numbers, right? Um, now, even, even accepting that nearly, well, most of them would have just gone to a beach, uh, quite a lot will have visited um, Spain's historic cities no? and traveled around the country a bit. And yet the prisms through which Spain is consistently viewed in the UK involve kind of two myths. I think one is the black legend, which dates back to uh, Protestant Netherlands and England in the 16th century and their battles against Catholic Spain, and which portrays Spain as a kind of obscurantist, uh, authoritarian, rather cruel country or culture. And then the other uh, myth is the romantic myth of the 19th century, which presents it as um, sensual, um, idle, and resolutely pre-modern. And I think both of those myths are still around, out there, in, in the way that uh, the, the country is, is often viewed. And um, I mean, I was reminded of the Black Legend and some of the coverage of um, of um, the Catalan events of 2017, which uh, during which I lived in Spain and, and, and covered them. Um, there was a Times headline, which I can't resist quoting. Ghosts of civil war haunt Spain in its Catalan madness. Um, well, actually, no. Uh, this was a very contemporary conflict. And, um, you know, Franco uh, is largely forgotten now in Spain. Did you say that again? <laughs> yes, the guy was called Franco. He, he governed for, you know, from 1939 and as a dictator until until he died in his bed in 1975. Um, but I think if if Spanish history history is actually much more complicated and much more interesting than those myths allow. And and um, what I want to do in this talk is. Um, which covers the same ground as the book, a lot of the same ground, um, is look back at the last 50 years, and especially the last 15 years. And I first visited Spain in 1971, in my first summer vacation as an undergraduate. It was a very different country, and I visited a lot since, and I began to write about it in 2008, uh, at the time of the financial crisis. And then, as Andrew said, I was the correspondent there more recently. Um, and I think if, if we look at the last um, 50 years, they, they subdivide into kind of three periods. The first was the transition to democracy after Franco's death, known in Spain just as the transition from 1975 until 1982, really, um, when the Socialist Party came to power with a large majority. Um, and then a, a new golden age of success from 1982 until 2008, that's slightly earlier, um, uh, 
and then a much more troubled period in the past 15 years. And those troubles have included austerity and corruption and political instability, which has, uh, and what in my view, uh, have been three waves of populism. Um, and I'm happy to discuss later what I mean by that. But, um, uh, but the first was from the left, the indignado movement, as it was called, um, uh, of young, of angry young people, uh, out of which came Podemos, a hard left uh, uh, party. And then the second populist wave was the transmutation, or the mutation, sorry, of Catalan nationalism, which had been around for a century, into separatism. And then the third was Vox, more recently, a populist nationalist party of the hard right. As a result of the polarization and fragmentation, what had been a stable two, a system dominated by two parties, the socialists and the center-right popular party or people's party, PP in Spanish, um, uh, has fragmented. Um, and um, Spain is now embroiled in, uh, uh, in this fragmented politics, which Andres uh, referred to. Um, the, um, and Andres uh, mentioned the fact that um, the elect well, there's not been a majority government in Spain since 2015. And uh, the latest election has left the, co the country politically on, a, on an eye edge. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So what are the sources of these troubles in the past 15 years? In the view of all three of those populist movements, uh, the underlying causes involve fundamental flaws in the transition settlement, settlement and in Spanish democracy. Um, I think that's wrong. I think they are, broadly speaking, the ills of democracies everywhere in Europe, in the current period, in, in, in the last 10 years, no? in Europe, in the United States, and in Latin America. Spain is not fundamentally different as the 1960s tourist slogan said, Spain is different. It's not, but like all countries, it has its own specificities and peculiarities. And in, in its case, those peculiarities, well, I'm gonna highlight two. One is the depth of the, of the divide, the left-right divide, which is unbridgeable, uh, or it seems to be unbridgeable at the moment. If you look at Germany, it has its grand coalitions. If you look at um, uh, France, it, it is governed by a broad centrist movement. Italy has had its technocratic governments. Spain has a proportional representation system like those countries, and unlike Britain. Um, and yet in Spain, it's proved impossible for the two main parties to collaborate, especially in the last uh, few years. And I think it's true that in the earlier period of the earlier part of the past 50 years, there was a bit more collaboration. But I do think that the depth of that divide does in a way go back to the Civil War. And I, I could talk about that if, if, if you'd like me to. But the more important of the two specificities, I think, or, or somewhat more important, is the relative strength of peripheral nationalisms in Spain, or if you like, which is to use an oxymoron, regional nationalisms, or specifically Catalonia and the Basque country. And I think the reason for that, like many things, is rooted in history and geography. Um, and Spain, by Western European standards, is a large and mountainous country. And until there were high-speed trains and planes and motorways, it was very hard to get around. And that delayed the formation of an of a internal market. And industrialization happened on the coast with the Catalan textile industry and then the Basque iron and steel industry. And industrialization in those regions brought an inflow of migrants from the rest of Spain and social tensions. And the bourgeoisie in both places had resort to local nationalisms, peripheral nationalism, their own nationalisms, in part as a way of um, 
uh, administering those um, pensions. And this was a period, of course, of um, nationalism across Europe. And in many cases, what Eric Hobsbawm called the invention of tradition, the invention of a national tradition. Right? Uh, and it applies, that applies in, in, in many countries. Um, I think the comparison with France on this point is very instructive. Um, there's a, a wonderful book of modernization theory, which I think stands up better than most books on modernization theory, by a historian called Henri Weber, um, which is just, it's called Peasants into Frenchmen, and it's just come out in Spanish for the first time, actually. Um, and he points out that in 1863, a quarter of the French population did not speak French. And the patchwork of languages in France was much greater than that in Spain at the time. But the post-revolutionary state in France imposed a single language and a single culture from the top down with three crucial interventions, especially in the Third Republic from 1870 onwards. One was a crash program of rural road and railway building. The second was a compulsory primary education in French, in the French language. And the third was that military service no longer was a racket that only the poor could not avoid, but it became universal and it became a school for citizenship. And if you look at the history of Spain, the Spanish state tried to do all of that, but it wasn't strong enough uh, to succeed to the same degree as happened um, in, in France. I'm gonna have a little bit of water. The transition settlement after Franco died um, recognized the reality of the sense of difference among many Catalans and Basque. And the democratic constitution of 1978 represented a historic compromise um, in two ways. Firstly, the left accepted a parliamentary monarchy and not the restoration of the Republic, which had been overthrown by Franco in the Civil, in the civil War. And the right accepted decentralization, and in fact, radical decentralization. Um, Article two of the Constitution, and mo much of the Spanish Constitution was copied from uh, the West German basic law, which was Germany's constitution, right? and it proclaimed the indissoluble unity of the Spanish nation, which is a stress on territorial integrity, which is common to all continental European constitutions, um, although it's less familiar to us here in Britain. Right? But it went on to add that it recognizes and guarantees the right to autonomy of the nationalities and regions that compose it and solid solidarity among them all. I and mean, that was an inspired fudge. It talked of nationalities rather than Catalonia and the Basque country as nations, so as not to inspire, uh, to alarm the right too much. And um, it ended up granting decentralization uh, to all the regions of Spain in what was known as cafe para todos, coffee for all, coffee all round. It seemed like an inspired fudge, but it has stored up problems. No? Uh, which I will talk about in a moment. But for its first 25 years, the constitutional settlement was very, very successful in, um, and it was accepted by Catalans uh, and by many, but not all Basques. Um, the second part of the transition settlement, which has also become controversial, was um, an amnesty, which had been a demand of the left of the Communist Party since 1956. Um, it uh, was not a pact of forgetting, it was an amnesty. It meant that Franco's torturers did not go to jail. And you know, that is contrary to the principles of transitional justice as, it, as it's called now. But it allowed the transition to happen successfully. And one shouldn't forget that it was much more fraught than it now seems because there was eta terrorism, and they were, there were murders all the time and so on. So it was a close run thing, but it was, um, but it was successful. Along with that went an, a tacit agreement 
by the politicians not to use the past as a political weapon in the present. That's often called a pact of forgetting, but that's a misnomer, it's not. I mean, Spanish society has proceeded to remember the civil war and repression and so on copiously. I mean, in, in, in newspaper articles, in films, in books, in, in exhibitions and so on. Right? And there's been a huge amount of historical research uh, in Spain in the last, uh, particularly in this century, which has overturned some of the tenets of, uh, of recent Spanish history as written by Brits in particular. Right? Um, now that has come under, that uh, agreement has come under criticism, especially from, from the left in, in, in the past uh, 15 years or so. Um, and there have been two laws of historical memory. Um, we can discuss historical memory. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, an oxymoron as well. But um, um, uh, I think it was it's absolutely legitimate and right that um, people whose relatives were murdered during the Civil War or the Repression, and they don't know where their remains are, I think the state should help them. I think that should be without question. Secondly, I think it was right that Franco should not be buried in the Valley of the Fallen um, because he was not one of the Fallen, firstly, but that's a detail. But uh, secondly, because it's a state tomb and he should not be in a state tomb and he's now privately buried, that's fine. But it's another thing to um, say that the state should take sides in history wars, especially after a civil war, uh, because I think that is intended to deepen wounds and not to heal, heal them. Anyway, the transition helped to give um, Spain a highly successful quarter century of economic growth, a growing welfare state, cultural achievement, and a return to the mainstream of Western Europe, entering the European economic community as it then was, and NATO. And Spain also, having been a country where issues of personal morality were controlled by the Catholic Church and the state, it evolved very quickly into what I call, in the, in the title of a chapter in the book, Scandinavia in the Sun, but I have put a question mark. You know? Spain successively um, liberalized and legalized divorce, uh, abortion, gay marriage, uh, uh, stem cell research, euthanasia. And uh, uh, in, I think the majority of Spanish society is very comfortable with that. And, and along with Ireland, it's the country in Europe where I think um, uh, it, there's been greatest, swiftest change in issues of personal morality. Right? Now, a first harbinger of trouble came in 2004, and we, I was discussing this with Luis Caracano the other day, uh, with the terrorist, Islamist terrorist attacks on uh, trains in Madrid, suburban trains in Madrid, uh, which killed 193 people on the eve of a general election. And Jose Maria Aznar, the PP uh, prime minister at the time, uh, uh, attempted to blame this on ETA, uh, uh, that didn't wash, um, and a wave of public anger swept José Luis Zapatero and the socialists to office in a wholly unexpected victory. And that left a legacy of bad blood between uh, 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 a mistrust between the two main parties. Um, it also complicated things in Catalonia. Um, but it was the financial crisis of 2008 which fund fundamentally changed the political mood in Spain, as happened, of course, elsewhere in, in Europe. In Spain, the crisis triggered a prolonged slump from 2008 until 2013. Spain had actually not been fiscally profligate. It was the Financial Times, the Lex column in the Financial Times, I remember it vividly, uh, coined this term, the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, which went down very badly in Spain because it actually had a fiscal surplus at the time of uh, in 2008. But what it had 
was that the whole country had been complicit in a massive housing bubble, which nobody had blew the whistle on. Because Spain suddenly found itself after the formation of the euro, the creation of the euro, Spain suddenly found itself with German interest rates rather than Spanish interest rates and proceeded to borrow and borrow and borrow to build and build and build. And then the financial crisis triggered the bursting of the bubble and, and, uh, and a, a deep housing bust, which brought down much of the financial system and especially the cajas de, de Aroro, as they were called, the savings banks, the local savings banks, uh, which were supposed to be non-profit and so on. It, it also exposed a, a web of corruption, particularly at local level, involving officials of the Cajas de Aoros and local politicians and developers. And that became a big irritant at the time of the crisis. Um, Zapatero never really understood, I think, what hit him with the, with the crisis. He, I mean, he tried to respond with fiscal stimulus, but was forced to reverse course by the European Commission. And his resort to austerity damaged the credibility of the socialists. And the first consequence of that was a landslide victory for the PP in, um, in 2000, I always get this date wrong, 2012 or 2013? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2011. Yeah. yeah, November 2011. Okay. Um, under Mariano uh, Rajoy. Um, so the, this was the apparent continuation of political business as usual, but that was misleading because the impact of the slump on Spanish society was profound and especially on younger Spaniards. The unemployment rate surged to 27%. The average income of people under 35 fell by a quarter. And it was not until mid-2017 that the economy recovered its level of 2008. That uh, sense of public anger when you combine austerity with corruption, which is always politically toxic anywhere in a democracy, spawned the indignados and then, and then Podemos. And Podemos mixed Leninism with um, Peronist populism from Argentina. Uh, um, and Inigo Erejón, its second number two leader, was and is a fan of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, uh, the theorists of, um, of um, Peronist uh, populism. Um, While well, Pablo Iglesias, the, the leader, who is a Leninist basically, but very media savvy, and um, he railed against the caste which is a term, I mean, he said it was the people against the past. And that's a term borrowed straight from the, the populist five-star movement in, in Italy. Um, and by 2015, Podemos grew very fast. And by 2015, it seemed poised to overhaul the socialists, which if you, uh, as you may remember, was what happened in Greece, um, where Syriza, uh, overhauled PASOK, the traditional social democratic party, which never recovered. Um, and at the same time, Ciudadanos, with which Luis was associated, um, uh, which was originally, it was a kind of breakaway uh, or a movement of disquiet of uh, a wing of the Catalan Socialist Party, which was opposed to Catalan nationalism. And then it, it grew into the makings of a Spain-wide liberal centrist party. It never quite carried that out, but that was what it promised. And so with the rise of these new forces in the general election of um, 2015, not only did Rajoy lose his majority, but the com combined vote share of the two traditional parties, the Socialists and the PP, was reduced from 84% in 2008 to just 51%. So it was like a bomb at the political system, right? Um, but that proved to be the high, the high watermark for, for Podemos and it, it didn't overhaul the socialists um, and it's been declining ever since. And now it's been all but absorbed into a new movement called Sumar, which is led by Yolanda Diaz who's actually a communist 
daughter of a trade unionist, uh, a deputy prime minister in Sanchez's government, but it's a, she's more moderate in many ways than Iglesias or, or indeed Erejón. Um, and in July, Sumar was the fourth largest party with 31 seats in the lower house of parliament, but that was down from 38 in uh, the previous election. Turning to the second populist force, what explains the explosive growth of separatist sentiment in Catalonia in this century? It starts with a tangled tale, that of a, an attempt by Pascal <coughs> Maragall, who was a visionary socialist mayor of Barcelona, but who yearned to be president of the general that the regional government, where Jordi Pujol, uh, of a mainstream nationalist party had ruled for 20 years, and he tried to outflank Pujol on nationalist, uh, uh, in, in nationalist terms, and offered a new statute of autonomy for Catalonia. And this was a chapter of accidents. Uh, uh, just as David Cameron promised a referendum in Britain uh, for the 2015 election, because he expected to lose the 2015 election, and then he won it, and the rest is history, sadly. Um, so in Catalonia, uh, or in re with regard to Catalonia, Zapatero agreed to the idea of a new statute because he didn't think he'd have to deal with the, with the messy consequences of that because he didn't expect to win the election, but he did. Um, what happened was that the new statute, um, which uh, define Catalonia as a nation and, uh, and was going to include uh, its own judiciary and so on. Um, it was approved in a referendum in Catalonia, but only 48% of the electorate voted right, in that. But then four years later, the Constitutional Tribunal rejected 14, 14 of its key clauses. Now, Spanish justice grinds so slowly as to be in some ways injustice, right? And that certainly created a lot of bitterness in Catalonia. But I think the second and bigger factor in the growth of separatist sentiment was again, austerity and corruption. In 2011, uh, Artur Mas, who was uh, Pujol's successor, uh, and his party was really a kind of center-right Christian Democrat party. And he embraced budget cuts with some enthusiasm. And he went to present his budget to the Catalan parliament. And there was a big group of indignados who surrounded the Catalan parliament and he couldn't get there and he had to go in a helicopter, which was very humiliating. And his response was to, um, and also I think to the fact that there were corruption investigations going on into his party, um, was to try and deflect attention, I think, which he did quite successfully by embracing the cause of independence and launching the campaign for independence, which peaked in um, 2017. Um, uh, now, uh, Tomas and uh, Carlos Puigdemont, the, the president of the Generalitat in 2017, who, who organized the unconstitutional referendum and did the unilateral declaration of independence, they presented this as an exercise in radical democracy, which is exactly the same argument actually as the Brexiteers. And in exactly the same way, I think that claim of radical democracy masks what is identitarian populism at the bottom. And there are other readings, of course, of Catalan discontents, but I think it's one important uh, reading of them. And Puigdemont um, uh, liked to invoke uh, un sol pobla, which in Catalan means a single people. But Cat Catalonia never was a single people. Uh, polls showed that independence only briefly commanded over 50% uh, support, and it's now back down to under 40%. Catalonia has always been deeply divided. Um, as en Enric Prat de la Riba, who was an a Catalan nationalist politician of the early 20th century, who is an inspiration to the current generation separatists. But as he put it, quote, age old living together has created bonds with the larger unit of Spain, which could not be broken. 
and he never thought independence was viable as a result. And I think that continues to be true. So the separatists touched a void in 2017. No European government entertained the notion of um, Afghan independence and still less their attempt to impose it unilaterally. But with long jail sentences, Spanish justice, I think, overreacted. And Sanchez, Sanchez's decision to Pedro Sanchez's decision, I haven't introduced him yet. I mean, the prime minister since 2018, uh, socialist prime minister, um, his decision to pardon the jailed leaders in 2020, I think it was astute. It brought calm to Catalonia and support for separatism fell because, you know, a big irritation or a big cause of a sense of humiliation was, um, was removed. And in the July election, the Catalan nationalist parties combined all together, won only 14 seats down from 23 in the previous election. Lastly, what of Vox? Um, it began life as a splinter from the PP. It was given a huge impulse by the Catalan events because many Spaniards thought the country was going to be broken up, right? And they were alarmed. Uh, and Vox channeled that alone. But as the Catalan issue has um, receded, it turned to trying to exploit undocumented immigration and now increasingly traditional values and culture wars in which Podemos is an enthusiastic participant on the other side. So does Vox represent a revival of Franquismo? I don't think so. I mean, its reference, uh, Victor Orban in Hungary and uh, the Law and Justice Party, which I hope has just been defeated in Poland and, um, and Meloni in Italy. It's a very contemporary party in that sense, even if it has a few Franquistas mm -hmm. in it. Um, it also is losing ground. It lost a fifth of its votes at, at the last election and 19 seats. So all three populist challenges and Ciudadanos, which has disappeared, have faded or are fading. Right? Um, and the July election saw a partial recovery of the traditional parties with their combined vote rising again to 65% of the total, not back to 80%, but on the way. But as Andres mentioned at the beginning, Spain is now in this world of coalition politics in which there are two blocks, one on the right and the other of the left, plus Basque and Catalan and Gallego nationalists. Um, Sanchez, um, he figured that world when in 2016, he refused to abstain to allow the PP, which was the largest party, to form a government saying no is no, which is a phrase which sums up the mood of Spanish politics since then. Um, it temporarily cost him his job uh, because the, uh, the regional leaders in the Socialist Party pushed him aside. He then won his job back again in a primary vote and has since kind of uh, neutralized the, uh, uh, any dissent in the party or most, most dissent in the party. Um, so Sanchez uh, in 2020 formed Spain's first coalition government. Spain had been unique in the EU along with Cyprus in not having had coalition government. And it had its first coalition government of the left. Um, the pandemic hit immediately. EU, EU aid came and helped. I think the government was fairly successful for the first three years. Um, it increased the minimum wage a lot without increasing unemployment, without unemployment rising. It did a useful labor reform, even if a lot of the inspiration for that came from the European Commission. Um, it has expanded vocational training, which is an important need in Spain. Um, and it, Sanchez broadly kept the show on the road, right? um, despite only having a minority in the, in the parliament. He's um, without doubt the most skillful Spanish politician of the current era, but he's proved to have no red lines. And that alarms um, quite a lot of Spaniards, including some in the Socialist Party. He concluded in 2021, um, that coalition politics was here to stay in Spain. And he calculated that the PP was trapped by its need 
to have the support of Vox in order to get into power. And uh, given the range of extremist forces in Spain, one might wonder why Vox is the only one to whom a cordon sanitaire has been applied. But it is thus, and the PP is the only party that will touch Vox. But Sanchez realized that he needed to boost his coalition partner. Uh, and so he supported Yolanda Diaz in her efforts to displace Pablo Iglesias and Podemos and create Sumar, which is a more pliable coalition partner. And he waved through some badly drafted and rather questionable Podemos inspired laws, which he'd held back for the first three years on matters such as historical memory, sexual consent, and trans and animal rights. And he also forged a closer parliamentary alliance with Bildu, which is the successor party to ETA, the Basque terrorist group. It's the Sinn Féin of Spain, if, 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 if you like. Now, given that ETA uh, only dissolved in uh, 2018, and given that it carried on killing until for a decade, decade longer than the IRA, um, my, many Spaniards feel that it should be the subject of a cordon sanitaire, as Sinn Féin still is in Ireland, because it hasn't issued a full and wholehearted condemnation of terrorism yet. And until it does so, should it have a role in democratic politics? I think many people thought not. Um, now, Sanchez is one of the reasons that he's been successful is that he's imperturbable um, and a risk taker. And at the end of May, there was a regional and local election in Spain, which the PP uh, won pretty handsomely. It won basically because the vote for the far left collapsed um, because of all the squabbling within the far left. Right? And Sanchez's response was uh, interesting. I mean, he immediately called a snap election, which nobody had expected. And I have to say, we were still in Madrid on the 29th of May. And my immediate reaction was of surprise. And my second immediate reaction was, this is good news for my book. So, uh, which it was. Uh, but um, it was a smart move because it caught um, uh, uh, Feijó, the, Alberto Núñez Feijó, the leader of the, of the uh, PP of balance. It nipped in the bud any criticism within the Socialist Party, which we started, and it forced the far left to stop squabbling and, uh, and come together, which it did. And Feijó made mistakes in the campaign. He, he tried to make it a campaign about repealing Sanchismo instead of offering a positive vision of what he would do if he was to govern Spain, which is what he should have done. So the Pepe was the largest party, uh, but even with Vox and with uh, a couple of small regional parties, who allied with it, it fell four votes short of the 176 needed in the lower house of parliament to form a government. Now, as Andres mentioned, Sanchez needs the affirmative votes of all the Catalan and Basque uh, nationals, which he didn't get last time, but their price is much higher than in the past. And um, Puigdemont, who since 2017 has been a fugitive from Spanish justice in, uh, in Brussels, actually in Waterloo, he lives. Um, um, he has said that his condition for supporting a Sanchez uh, government is, or supporting Sanchez's investiture, is a referendum and an amnesty. Well, Sanchez has said he's not going to do a referendum. He is negotiating on an amnesty. The problem is that an amnesty, most lawyers consider it to be unconstitutional. It's not the same as a pardon. It's the state accepting that it was wrong in the, and apologizing in the juridical tradition of Spain. Sanchez had spoken out against an amnesty right up until the last two months. He didn't campaign on it, and it's quite clearly for his own benefit. And so it's very controversial. And even if it's approved, it may yet be knocked down by constitutional tribunal. Um, 
I think it, it's now come down to an argument about you could just about sell it politically because there is a case for de-judicializing as Sanchez calls it, Catalonia. And these trials still going on six years later is really, to put it uh, mildly. But he would have to, it would have to have in the preamble to an amnesty, an acceptance by the Catalan separatists of the constitution, a declaration of loyalty to the constitution. So Puigdemont is faced with the chance of personal freedom of not going to jail uh, or renouncing his political beliefs. And when it comes down to, if it comes down to that, I suspect he may choose um, not to renounce his political beliefs, but we'll see. I think it, if Sanchez does not get the necessary votes by November the 26th, then um, a repeat election, as happened in 2015, 16, and 2019, will automatically be called for, for January. And I think it goes either way. It could go either way. Now, just to briefly sum up, what then are the prospects for Spain? And in, in the short term, if there is a repeat election, I would expect the votes of both the Socialists and the PP to go up a, a bit more. Um, but the reality is that some 2 million Catalans still want to leave Spain. And that is a problem that the country needs to address. Um, I think it would not be good if it festered. I think there are some things you can do. I think a more wholehearted acceptance of the Catalan language would help. Personally, I think um, I, it rankles with many Spaniards who say they should have the same right to be educated, their children should have the same right to be educated in Spanish in Catalonia is in the west of Spain, but personally, I think accepting compulsory education in Catalan is a small price to pay, frankly. Um, but, you know, that's a matter of debate in Spain. Um, I think the Basque country is more worrying in a way now, actually, because Bildu has overhauled the Basque National Party, which has governed the Basque country for a long time and governed it well on the whole. And you could have the prospect of a Bildu um, regional government in Spain when there's an election uh, which is due next year, which I think would be problematic. But then that said, look around Europe and indeed the world at the moment, and Spain's situation doesn't look so bad. No? The economy, which was worse hit than many of its neighbours during the pandemic, has recovered quite strongly, um, uh, and it's growing a little bit less slowly than its neighbours, um, at least for the time being. I think the society, at least until recently, has been less polarized than the politicians. I think the fact that Vox is not advancing anymore means that most of Spain's recent liberal advances on lifestyle issues look fairly safe. But the political battles are happening in a bubble and they're leading to increasing disillusion with politics in the country, which I think is a, is a problem. And there is, Spain has what, you know, Spanish political scientists call a partidocracy. I mean, a political system run by the party leaderships um, and the party leaders. Now it's an increasingly presidential, they're increasingly presidential parties in a PR parliamentary system. Although there's more internal democracy now in the PP than the socialists, which is another way of saying that Nunes Fejil doesn't control his party in the way that Sanchez controls his. But the PP has contributed, to, contributed its share to the negativity as well refusing to agree with Sanchez, the renewal of the general council of the judiciary, which makes judicial appointments, which is, you know, frankly, they should. Uh, um, it, it's the, the rising number of judicial, judicial posts are unfulfilled, which is a problem. And I think the other big problem is that many important issues are being neglected and they include adaption to climate change, which is a threat to life and to the economy, which recent summers have dramatized, potentially uh, jeopardizing both agriculture and tourism. There was a very interesting article in the FT on Saturday about the problems of Catalan apple growers because of drought and what they're doing to try and overcome it. You may have noticed there's a shortage of olive oil in British supermarkets, and that's because of the Spanish drought. Um, 
wages continue to be fairly low compared with many European countries. Spain needs to improve productivity um, in order to get higher wages. Unemployment remains higher than it should be. Schools are not, are not as good as they should be. And the public administration is inefficient. In the World Economic Forum's competitiveness study for 2019, Spain ranked seventh out of 141 countries in the world for infrastructure, for the quality of its infrastructure, but 114th out of 141 with the burden of government regulation on business, and 121st for the long-term vision or lack of it of government. In short, for most Spaniards, life is fairly good and the rubbish gets collected, which is not a minor point. I've never seen a fox or a rat in a Madrid street. There are occasionally wild boars are detected on the outskirts, but that's good. Um, it's not because of a lack of rubbish collection. But if the country is to continue to prosper, it needs to find way that will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I think you have covered quite a lot of issues and you've probably raised quite a lot of questions. So uh, we got time now to ask questions and I see that there are a lot of people that want to break the ice. So we're going to start over there and then we'll come in this way. So if you can state your name and your affiliation and uh, then ask your question. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Indeed. Um, I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst. I know uh, largely on um, the Ukraine war. Certainly there are very considerable Spanish language implications to that. But my question- Your name, as a, sorry? As a, sorry? Your name. I'm sorry, Ewan Grant, Ewan Grant. Um, my question follows on from that. Um, where does, how has Spain managed to leverage, if it has, its um, role as a link between Europe and the Spanish-speaking world, particularly given the growing strategic importance of Latin America. Do you want me to, do you want to take some? I'm an economist subscriber, by the way. Um, <laughs> Should we take several? Should we take several? Let's take several. So there were two at the, the back. So you, should, yes, please go ahead. Should I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi. So my name is Emilio. I'm a Spanish student here. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Emilio. International relations and Chinese. Okay, both here. Um, so very interesting topic. Thank you very much. And very interesting talk. I wanted to ask you, why do you think we Spanish seem to be so harsh with the political center? So we first have UCD, UPN, and most significantly Ciudadanos. Uh, is this because of what you were mentioning of the shadow of civil war? Or is it, yeah, just wanted to know your opinion. Thank you. And let's take a third one. So over there. Um, yeah, do you, sorry, uh, my name's Cameron. I'm a political sociology student. Um, and I wondered if you see uh, populism as having kind of been quelled uh, in the last couple of years, or do you think that it will exert it, or where you see populism going now in Spain? Can you speak to that? Because it's um... where do you see populism going now in Spain? Right, my course. Okay, um, yeah, um, Spanish government traditionally set much store on um, much rhetorical store in Latin America. That um, the, the, the fulcrum of Spanish um, foreign policy is to be uh, at the center of the EU and uh, good relations with the US and a bridge for Latin America to Europe. Yeah? Uh, in practice, that's um, often just rhetoric. To be fair, I think you know the Spanish presence in the EU, uh, which is currently happening, um, uh, you know they did uh, install the um, EU Latin American summit, which hasn't happened since 2015. It did happen. You know, some claim to be an achievement in itself, but given the divided state of Latin America. And given the other more immediate priorities that the EU has, and there was you know some money put up by the EU for infrastructure and green transition projects, which is potentially useful if it actually happens. 
Um, uh, but I think actually, um, you know, the relationship with Latin America is, is, is very complicated. I think Spain was enormously influential in the 1980s. In Latin America, I was Democrats because of this transition. Um, when Latin America was, I think, very concerned with the transition. Um, uh, and now that American policy has fallen victim to the domestic political partisanship in many ways, you know, and you now have. Uh, a very large things with in Spain. Uh, you have a lot of Latin American parents. But Cuba and Venezuela have become kind of external issues, which I think reduces Spain's influence. And I would just say last that I actually think the crucial foreign policy issue for Spain is the Maghreb, is North Africa. Its neighbors, because they are the source of important part of its energy, because Spain is a big energy importer. Of course, there is a standing issue in the Sahara, because managing that relationship. Easy. I think Spain needs actually more experts on North Africa. It has, it has surprisingly few. Um, then, second question um, uh, you're, studying, you're studying the right things, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, um, uh, the weakness at the center, which is very domestic. Question, politics question. I mean, I think there's an emotional sense in which the left right divide of the civil war takes a long time to recede. And the civil wars are, the wars are always the subsequent Civil wars are particularly difficult. Um, uh, and people do remember them. You know? um, and, um, so I think I don't think the explicit appeals work work in, in the there was an extraordinary regional election in Madrid in twenty twenty one. They kind of standing to fascism. And Passaran, the phrase of the, of the civil war, they shall. And it, you know, he did extremely bad left politics, left official politics, as we say. Um, but I do think it's a factor. And then the other factor, I think, um, the two main parties are very deeply rooted. You know? There's not much space, or well, traditionally, there was not much space. In the middle, even though most voters want to, um, uh, somewhere close to. So, various, there's been various attempts and they've all failed. The, the uh, UCD, which is the party of Adolfo Suarez, the, the first prime minister, of the, of the prime minister of the transition, that died away very quickly. Then there was something called UPID, which was a, uh, uh, in some ways similar to. Died away. And then I have to say, in the case of Ciudadanos, I think that, in my view, its problem was that um, Albert Rivera is uh, first leader, first national leader, um, uh, tried to turn the party into something which um, uh, it did not get the answer. Instead of turning into a Spanish version of the FPD, in general, a huge party that could have an either side, which would be socially movable, but they're economically liberal as well. Uh, he 
out of hubris, put it into his head that he could displace the VP as the main party of the right. And he failed. So I think there are some ad hominem issues for the strong. And then the third question on the, the future of populism is well, I mean, my view is let me say that, but why do I say they're populist? You know, on the classic definition, the definition of populism, and the one I like is uh, Jan van der Bullen, which you may be familiar with. The populism is a method of doing politics rather than ideology, but it involves a leader, claims to be a kind of savior, and the leader defines the people. It's, you know, the authentic people. It's not all the citizens, it's the people, right? And the third thing is the enemy, right? You need an enemy to be a successful in progress. And for the Catalan, uh, and for, for Pablo Iglesias, it was the caste. For the Catalan separatists, it was Madrid, just like it was Brussels for the Brexiteers. And then for Vox, the enemy is the, is the kind of politically correct uh, and liberal establishment. Gramsci in you know, cultural and Yemeni. Um, and I think they're all failing. I mean, I, mean, I mean, they're all weaker than they were at their, their high point. Is that definitive? Who knows? But I do think Spain is moving on from that period. Right? Uh, now that we live in such an uncertain a world of such radical uncertainty in so many ways that you know it's very hard to draw definitive conclusions at the moment. But on the evidence we have so far. I think that they will continue to decline. Circumstances could mean that that changes. It's not a very satisfactory answer. But we don't have you know, many satisfactory answers in the world in general. All right, so next round, please. please. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was supposed to be careful and, and neutral, and, and it, was, it was a really very, very nice one for the last few years. I wanted to do a bit of uh, kind of factual history uh, to try. Uh, when you talk about Podemos, uh, and not Podemos, forget about Ciudadanos, because that's too close, too close for comfort. Um, so, so there was a beautiful moment in Spain between January and July 16. Uh, we were negotiating with the Socialists for a coalition uh, government. Podemos had a chance to, to kind of decide, let us govern the coalition between the Socialists and Ciudadanos. And, and and there were these two wings in Podemos that you mentioned, the Leninist uh, Iglesias and the Peronist uh, Rajon, and uh, Rajon lost. Iglesias thought, let's go to another election and pass. The same thing that Rivera did, has the socialists, because he failed. So here's the, here's the counterfactual history. Um, you know Argentina, and you know Peru, and you know the socialist movements in Latin America. If, 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 if they had left, uh, if they had, if they had led the socialist kind of move right and occupy space with Podemos, uh, was there was there a germ really in, in Podemos for a for a hegemonic movement? Could they have become the populist party that actually dominates the right, like Erdogan had, or was there any other things in Podemos that and in Spain that prevented us from from going the path of the Venezuela or of uh, Argentina's Peronists? Um, what, 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 what were the real kind of limits to Podemos ambitions? Was it really just the guesses that it's not very smart? Let's accumulate. So you over there. Um, thank you for the talk. You mentioned that Pedro Sanchez has faced some controversy. Sorry, your name is. Oh, uh, I'm uh, Javier. I'm, I'm Spanish. I'm doing international relations uh, masters. I did my undergrad in history here uh, as well. So you mentioned that. Pedro Sánchez has managed to weather a lot of controversy and he's quite skillful in maneuvering about what do you think are the personal attributes that he has that still endear him to a significant amount, uh, enough amount of the, the populace of the voter that he can seem to weather these close run elections and maintain his grip on power. And uh, last question this round. Uh, hi, my name is I'm a researcher at the and my inquiry relates to the younger generation, because for what I've been able to do most, people my age who are a bit younger, who are starting to participate in elections in Spain, um, he doesn't don't feel represented by private politicians and can find themselves as being apolitic. 
And on the other hand, I've also witnessed um, politicians uh, telling young aspiring politicians that they are too good to become politicians. So as a Spaniard, um, my question is, what is the future of the Spanish politics if uh, the Spanish younger generations do not favor this parliament and they are told they are too good to lose that career? Okay. Well, was, I mean, I think, I think I would answer by looking at Greece, actually. Um, well, so it's a rising government. It has a kind of sort of populist first six months with Barry Fakis, after it's selling books there. Um, and um, uh, but then they, and the European Commission forces them to Greece is, and Spain, when Podemos was strong, Spain still needed the European Commission. And so I would have expected that to happen. And I, and I also would have expected kind of the splits to, you know, splits to come through. So moderation plus splits. Plus, I don't think there's a majority in Spain for a hard left government. I don't think there's a majority in this society. I'm going to lose this because I mean, you know, he was. Um, in in Lenin's jargon, he was a he was what was called in the Soviet Union in the twenties and thirties a liquidationist. I mean, he systematically uh, his colleagues because he saw them as rivals, okay, and installed his diplomatic partner as his number two in, in, the, in the most reactionary possible fashion. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so I, I think they would have probably had been brought further, but they didn't get further because of their flaws. You know? Sanchez, and that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't think people like, I don't think people love Sanchez. They don't love him at all. I don't think he inspires affection or love. Um, I think he inspires respect, perhaps fear in some quarters, but respect. Um, I mean, he's not empathetic. And the flip side of that, Lack of empathy, I think, is this complete impertability. Um, that you know, nothing phases him, you know, um, or very few things phase him. So, on one occasion, he says, okay, phased, but, but it, it never lasts. And uh, you know, I think he's very cold blooded in that sense. And, and you know, that's those are political qualities. Um, and um, uh, but I think he's also been blessed by his opponents. In, in the sense that they've been you know, not of the same quality in terms of political um, And then the third question. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned, I think, you know, what you, what you talk of in the text of this is so absolutely But I think it's a problem, and I said this in a lecture about Latin America here a couple of weeks it's a problem in Latin America as well. The best no longer go into politics. The best young people don't want to go into politics. The idea of politics as a vocation of public service, which was very strong and important. It's easy to mock, but I mean, it was important. I think that's gone. And I think um, uh, it's partly, the, as I said, it's partly the 24 hour news cycle. Which is unforgiving. Right? Um, Churchill was not because he drank in the day. And um, uh, so, you know, do you want that? Do you want your family in the spotlight? Can you shield them? You can a bit, but not much. I think that's one issue. I think the other issue is that you're not paid properly mm -hmm. in Spain. You know? You're not paid properly here either. Yeah? Um, I mean, it's not. Should be honest, you need to pay the problem if you want to have reasonable ones. You know, it's much more attractive to go into the private sector, uh, especially with the cost of housing and so on. You know, I mean, the world generation faces. You know. So I think those are structural issues which are going on in this space. Thank you very much. Uh, next round of questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, this might be a bit of a controversial question, but uh, so you mentioned Bildu, the fact that they're now in supporting the government, etc. Don't you think that it's a success of democracy, the fact that Bildu, which is the political branch of, well, before was said that, is now talking about minimum wage, uh, labor reform, and it's actually sitting down to negotiate with government? I think that would be fine if they had been, if they were sincere and honest with the general guys. And, uh, and until they do that, you know, then you know, they have blood on their hands. And, uh, and, um, but yeah, the point of, and remember that there wasn't really a peace process. Literally, and, you know, they just sit out. Dressed it up with a kind of peace process with a few international um, people. Um, and there were talks with um, both the sources and, and, and the PP, but they weren't negotiations really. Um, the only thing the government's negotiating was the return of prisoners to the West country, to jails in the West country. Um, so, um, uh, and they killed a lot of people. Killed a lot of people and extortion. I mean, ETA, in many ways, was the objectively in its practice, it was the closest thing to fascism that Spain has seen. And then they used violence to um, impose their will in many communities. Um, and you know, that's big stuff. And, you know, of course, it's better that there should be. Seeking the vote rather than using guns. Of course, that's an advice. But I think letting them into the process of political power you know, until they fully embrace democracy, which means renouncing their past, uh, you know, I think it's troubling for many, many people. I don't know whether you have uh, questions from the audience or uh, from online, or you have questions. Yourself. Uh, both, I guess, but uh, let's go with the audience. Uh, with the online audience, there is a couple of questions. One is relating to uh, Galician, Galician nationalist parties, or uh, let's say the lack of importance until now, or the potential uh, in the future. And the other one relates to this kind of um, politics holding back Spain has been relevant into the international position of Spain or in their international active role uh, of Spain in the world. And uh, just before you answer, there was another hand. Uh, yes. um, <clears throat> hi, Zach. Um, I wanted to ask about the I'm Ainoa. I'm from the Basque country in Spain. Um, so I am a little bit nervous to ask that question. But why do you think um, we And what do you do, Ainoa? Oh, me? I'm just a student. Um, I study HSPS in Cambridge. Um, yeah, so I'm just here. <clears throat> anyway, um, why do you think Yugo at the moment is so popular within Spain? Because it was the second, you know, most voted. In the Basque country. Yeah, in the Basque country. Why do you think that? Okay. So, first question, Galicia. I think Galicia is interesting because I think it has a very strong cultural nationalism, and the, it was, it was political translation is much weaker, and I think the remain weaker. They elected one member of um, um, they tried they've tried to adopt uh, the kind of green issues and so on. But I think um, for those who don't know, you know just say hold the the current leader of the, the national leader of the PP for kind of 20 years ran Galicia uh, and he speaks Galego. Uh, he talked regularly in Galego in, in, in Galicia. Um, and I think Galicia has been very successful. If you, it's, it's the region of Spain which has um, uh, increased its income per head most. In, in, in the last 30 years, whatever. It used to be one of the poorest regions in Spain, and it's no longer one of the poorest regions. It's been very successful. I think that cultural nationalism 
give it a strong sense of regional identity. And I think it works. But, um, and you know, there's a deep point there which I discuss in the book, which is you can recognize that Catalonia is a cultural nation, but it's not a non-logical conclusion from that. It has to be a nation state. Um, there are many more languages than nation states. And if it were a nation state, you can bet your life that a kind of ethnic cleansing would happen fairly soon, in which um, non catalan speakers would be encouraged to be by, by various means. Right? Um, and uh, sorry, the second question. Uh, Oh, the international position. Yes, I think I think Spain's domestic politics has weakened its international position, not least because it's needed the support of the European Commission for a long time now, right? in the form of the bailout of the banking system. Um, and I think the fact that it's um, that is, I mean, whatever, if a government is formed now, it will be a weak and probably short. And that is not there. It's um, in the fact that, you know, to be a strong player in the world, you really need a strong domestic political position, usually. You know? And that's just some other factor that changes that. Um, that's what we can see that basically, you know. I think it's a demand for change, which is, you know, <clears throat> and the fact that the, the mainstream vast national party has been in power for some more. And you know, people get tired and, and I mean, there hasn't been much corruption. Whether that's because it's not announced, I don't know. Um, uh, but I think it is, you know, I think Bill are quite clever at exploiting the, um, um, socioeconomic issues you now, you know, and, and green issues as well. Um, they also want independence, yeah? And that's another complication. I mean, the Basque National <laughs> Party in theory, the Basque National knows it has the best of all possible worlds in, in Spain, you know, and it has a financial settlement which is far more, I don't know, it's common, far more generous than the one they had if, if they were independent, you know, amongst other things. Um, so, uh, but I think it's mainly, the, and, and the fact that the violence stopped actually means that I think, you know, some people in the Basque country are prepared to vote for Bilbo in the way that they wouldn't have been uh, for, for its predecessors. You know? But so I think that is the fact. I think, you know, the problem here is that, you know, you need other, other forces of novelty, let's say, in the Basque country. We have. Time just for a last round of questions. So you go first, and then you, and then you, then you, and then so let's uh, go ahead, please. So my name is Jaime. I'm a PhD student in economics, visiting the Catalan Bank Center. And um, so my question is: uh, Sergio del Molino, who's written in La España Vacía and also the sequel. Mm -hmm. uh, one of his reflections is that um, you know, as a country. Spain or any country should have a, an image of what it is or a concept or a notion of what it is and what it wants to be or where it is going, what, what aspirations are. And since uh, you've written a, a book with the uh, word Spain in the title, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on this. What do you think uh, we are as a country? What, what, what notion of Spain do you have? That's a good question. So, uh, next question. Uh, um, I'm Selena. I'm also Spanish, uh, and I just finished a political sociology master's here at LSE. I've done a few courses on like Latin American history and politics and stuff, and the idea of pluralist nationalism is really big in these academic circles. Pluralist nationalism, and there's a lot of like social movements that are in favor and stuff. And I was just wondering your thoughts on whether like Spain declaring itself as plurinational no. to no, kind of no, include, yeah, 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 like different nations yeah. apart from the Spanish nation, whether it's like feasible and also desirable. Yeah, that would be my question. Uh, 
I'm Tristan. I'm French, but I live all my life in Spain. I'm second year in history and politics. And I wanted to know, uh, what do you think about separatist parties being part of a winning coalition? Do you think it's going to be a sustainable coalition? Will it solve any nationalist issues? And uh, my question is going to go uh, in the same direction. Um, <laughs> the way you, people can read the results of the elections in various and ways. Uh, and the way I read it is that uh, it was a big win for the mainstream parties, both the PP and the Socialist one. And you mentioned there were three types of nationalists, and they lost a big number of votes. I think I don't have the numbers, but it was a mess between the Catalan, well, the nationalists, uh, Vox, and Sumar uh, parties there. Yet they have a much, much bigger vote. By contrast, in Germany, we had elections nine years ago, less than 10 days ago, so in Bavaria and in Hessen. There, the alternative in Deutschland, so the extremists came in second. Uh, and, uh, yet, immediately, all other parties, mainstream parties that had lost votes, decided and knew they were going to talk together and find a solution. And they can all talk together. Why can this happen in Germany? And why is it so <coughs> possible for two parties that Actually, most of the majority, the growing share of the vote in Spain, to actually have any challenge to agree. Okay. Um, I will take your question last. Um, uh, just about the reverse. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I mean, um, personally, I'm, I'm half English, half Scottish, um, and. Um, I have no difficulty at all with the notion of Scotland being a cultural nation. I think it would be a big mistake for it to try to become a nation state. Um, so I, I kind of think that to send you explaining parts of Spain, I actually think recognizing Catalonia, the Basque country, and how they see our cultural relations in itself is no big deal. You know? um, uh, but I don't think it should follow from that. As I've just said, that they need to become nation states. The problem with, with doing that and doing that is, is it intended to make societies more inclusive, more united, or is it intended to divide more? And I think, you know, it depends on case and in context. It, it can go either way. So I think it's a complicated subject. But I, it, there's a lot of, as you know, I mean, there's a lot of resistance in, in uh, you know, uh, in in Spain to that. Um, I mean, I didn't say to be. I think in, I think in many ways it would be better if in 1978 the Constitution had given autonomy to Catalonia, the Basque Country, and Galicia, and stopped that because they would have had their special status. And and this is partly in the metaphor. Right, so you're being lumped with Andalusia here and next to it. <laughs> that the federalism was good for getting all these regions. All yeah, the regions to grow. I didn't say it. I meant to say it. I actually argue in the book that I think formal federalism would have been much better. I think it is a naturally federal country, and formal federalism would have set clear rules and it would have closed the process. And in Spain, the problem is being the process is open ended. So, and you would have had a Senate that, you know, represented the, uh, the regions and Barcelona could have felt more like Munich rather than Marseille and, you know, all the people in Barcelona. So, yeah, I mean, so, um, so, yeah, I think that was a big mistake. And uh, the, your questions were the future of the government and, and it's extraordinary leverage that you can lost the election, uh, um, which I agree completely. I mean, I think I still think it's quite natural. No, I I try. I'm going to call them. We are the institutions in Spain. But no, the obvious, if, if, if 
Cameron that he is proposing, the party's proposing, is for, I mean, he needs to get all these people for every single vote. Now you can, it's quite hard to overthrow many of these votes, quite hard to overthrow a prime minister in Spain because you need an alternative majority for an alternative prime minister. And that would be hard. But on the other hand, how much could this government do? It would, I think, face constant defeats and constant managing negotiations and painful. What's the point? Why has it come to this? This because the two main parties refuse to collaborate. I think in a, in a different country, Sanchez would have abstained to let Fejo govern and he, the PP government, govern. He could have set it as a, as a condition that Vox does not into the government. And you know, they would have had the vote for that. But um, um, you know, the PP now. Could offer to abstain. So, and why don't they do it? Because of this deep seated divide, which I think is political, it's partly cultural. Um, and, but the interesting thing is that the polls are starting to show that quite a large number of families, and you, some of you probably remember them more closely than me, but I think in some cases, a majority actually want the two main parties to collaborate in that way. And, you know, eventually it may happen. And then the last question. I say in the book that Spaniards are really obsessed with who they are rather than what they do. And it's important to pay more attention to what they do and what they don't do. And I've talked about what they don't do, what they need to do. Yeah. I think they're obsessed with what they are partly because of these identitarian peripheral nationalisms, partly because of 1898 and the trauma, trauma of the loss of the, of the empire and, 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 and the intellectual debate that that produced. And this sense that Spain is kind of, is different, which I think is always way Yeah, as I've said. Spain, well, I think it's going to be successful. Um, uh, I mean, I've put, I suppose, Jack is not second, I suppose, Jack is at the end of the book, who complains that Spain, the Spaniards are just interested in para y son, partying and son. And I said, well, that's not so bad, actually. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's true that you need more than that. That's true. But there are a lot of things good about Spain. Um, so what is Spain? It's partly the family. It's partly a sense of, you know, these, these generalizations are hopelessly unscientific, right? But, you know, my personal experience is that the quality of life and the human quality is very high. People have time for other people. You know, they really don't do this much. Right? And you make it. And that sense that you have to get on family. Uh, so I think Spain is all those things. And it's also parts of the economy are very creative and very modern and, and very efficient and productive. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it's. So uh, thank you very much, Michael. Being very attentive, it's a great question. Can I urge you, please, to make one of your I was going to say that. So I'm sure that Michael's intervention has whet your appetite to know much more. And you can find all that information in the book. So you can go there. But before you leave, uh, thank you very much, thanks to Michael, for coming here. Many thanks to all of you for being here for this uh, session, to all of you online. And remember, the Canada Lounge Center will still have events this term. The next one is on the 7th of uh, November, Tuesday, 6 o'clock, in which we will showcase the uh, amount of talent coming from Spain, but also from elsewhere, of the fellows that are currently in the center. So, 
Join our communication channels. Are there any Twitter or access is now called or in LinkedIn? And to follow the events that we'll have this done and in the community. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um,